I would like to thank uh, the university and uh, the organizers for uh, the invitation and for the opportunity to be here in Göttingen for the first time today. When I visited When I visited for the first time in Oxford's Bodleian Library, I was surprised to see those chained books. You may find, I assume, those chained books uh, in any other library uh, housing books from the Middle Ages. Therefore, the chaining of books was for me a medieval, non-enlightened idea. Why should books be chained? Will they run away? Well, the books themselves are indeed most valuable, if not irreplaceable, but why should the knowledge they contain be chained or fettered? I thought like that for a long time until I uh, read, read a few years ago Henry Petrovsky's fascinating book, The Book on the Bookshelf. The book is, of course, about the history of the bookshelf. I learned from his book that I was mistaken because I had not asked the correct question. I had to ask what was beforehand? Where were those books sheltered or held? Um, Petrovsky taught me that beforehand the books had been locked up inside a closet meaning that their removal to shelves was, as at that time in history, a revolution, an information revolution. The removal of the books from a locked cabinet to the public library, even if at that time in history changed, gave human beings the opportunity to create a social encounter and a place for dialogue next and attached to the book itself. Everything is, of course, relative. And to my mind, if we compare this chaining revolution of the Middle Ages to present times, we would compare it to the revolution created by uh, Google Books that was mentioned before. My main argument during today's lecture is that access creates relevance. We have the moral obligation to take care that all resources and knowledge bases in the humanities become accessible in an open manner without restrictions or barrier as much as legally possible to each person at home, which means today through the internet also. Hearing the previous speakers my argument perhaps sounds logical to all of you, because the assumption that humanities must be digitized and shared by all is one of the basic presumptions of the impressive text grids project that you are launching today. And this is, of course, the aim for sure of the Gettingen Center for Digital Humanities that is being dedicated and initiated here at university. It sounds perhaps simple and self-evident, but it does not always work that way practically. I personally feel, to my sorrow I have to say, that this simple idea still works in many cases against the stream. I would like to explain my argument by using the example of one of the most central projects that I have had the honor and responsibility to lead at Yad Vashem during the past several, several years. This project has been to make Yad Vashem's documentation and knowledge bases accessible in a clever digital manner through the internet to all interested users without any barrier. Yad Vashem was established in 1953 as the World Center for Documentation, Research, Education and Commemoration of the Holocaust. As the Jewish people's living memorial to the Holocaust, Yad Vashem safeguards the memory of the past and passes on its meaning for future generations. Therefore, 
Yad Vashem had, has attempted to collect everything that documents the Holocaust and the Jewish experience therein. This is because the Nazis wanted not only to murder the Jews, but also to uh, 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 vanish the, our ability to remember them. In order to know what we lost, we have to reconstruct this huge puzzle. This notion is very basic in the text that, that you may, may see here of the Yad Vashem law from 1953. The task of Yad Vashem is to gather into the homeland material regarding all those members of the Jewish people who laid down their lives. For this purpose, it continues, Yad Vashem shall be competent to collect, examine, and publish testimony of the disaster and the heroism. Therefore, our acquisition philosophy was from the very beginning holistic. Yad Vashem collects everything, documents, photographs, oral testimonies, pages of testimony, artifacts and work of art, etc., etc. These collections are the basis of all our activities. Indeed, the Yad Vashem archives houses the largest collection of Holocaust documentation in the world. To date, we uh, have approximately 140 million pages of documentation, more than 100,000 testimonies of survivors, approximately 400,000 photographs, and much more. The archives include millions of original documents, as well as millions of documents which we copied in microfilms, photocopies, and scans. In recent years, the Yad Vashem archives collection has grown by three to five million documents per year. We have a vision. Our vision is in Yad Vashem to enable easy and free access at home, of course in Yad Vashem as well, but mainly at home, through the internet to all materials related to the Holocaust in a manner that will allow the public to understand these materials in a context, in their context. Why do we have this vision and goal? Maybe it's a simple question, or maybe the answer is very, is very simple, but I, but I would like to uh, share with you uh, one of the main reasons to that. I think it's because we believe and affirm that we have a moral duty to the people behind these documents. I'll illustrate it by an example. The Yad Vashem archives contain hundreds of diaries, personal diaries. Miss Ruth Tauber donated one such diary to our archives approximately four years ago. The diary was written by her late husband, Rabbi Uri Febesh Tauber, during the years 1941-1944. Rabbi Tauber, who was born in Romania, arrived in Mogilev Podolsk in October 41. He was an inmate in the Mogilev Podolsk ghetto until the Red Army liberated the place. Mogilev, by the way, was one of the five points of entry to Transnistria, and during the war, almost 20,000 Jews lived there. As an educator, it was natural, maybe, that uh, Tauber would notice that a lot of orphans were gathered in the streets and uh, by the assistance of the local Jewish leadership, they established three orphanages. Tauber stayed at orphanage number one. The orphanage was open in April, April 42. By August 42, a few months later, it was home to no less than 450 children. Rabbi Tauber taught the orphans Hebrew and the, the Bible, Bible studies. Rabbi Tauber started to write his diary in German, written in Hebrew, Hebrew letters, Hebrew fonts, already in 1941. He tells about the daily hardships in the ghetto, about hiding Jews, about Paul Bilazarovich, for example, a 15-year-old youth who was on the editorial board of the orphanage's newspaper, and much more. It took us a year to preserve the diary and to save it. It's only, of course, one page of a lot. Then we invited Miss Ruth Tauber 
to see the results. She was, of course, very happy and became uh, very emotional. And at the end of the visit, she told us, by the way, that she has another item at home. But, I quote, it is not important, I think. That's what she told me. We, of course, visited her the day later at her home, and she gave us two notebooks that the children had compiled for her husband in the ghetto. Why? Because in January 44, they succeeded somehow to get fails certificates to all of them, and the orphanage was closed. The children were sent to the British mandate in Palestine, to the land of Israel, so they wrote to him warm farewells letters one of them was written by a young boy, Eliezer Gantberger, then 15 years old, and he wrote like that. I'll translate it from Hebrew to English. Memory, he wrote, is the only paradise from which a person cannot be expelled. It's only to repeat, to be repeated. Memory is the only paradise from which a person cannot be expelled. Eliezer Gantberger, Mogilev, January 44, 15, 15 years old. On the last page of the second notebook, I even found a photo of the teacher and the class. I searched in the Yad Vashem Central Database of Holocaust Victim Names, I will relate to that later. So I searched there for a person named Eliezer Gandberger and found no person named Eliezer Gandberger. However, I did find a very similar name, Eliezer Dagan, who had filled up two pages of testimony. This is what we call a page of testimony. It, we began to uh, uh, collect those pages in mid-50s uh, all over the world. It's a short description, a short testimony that survivors and relatives filled up on the memory. It's like a virtual tombstone for each one of the family members who passed away. So I found Eliezer Dagan, who had filled up two pages of testimony about his parents, named Antwilger. An address appeared on the form filled out by the submitter of the testimony, so I used the local telephone directory and then called the home phone number. Miss Dagan answered the phone. Her husband, she told me, had passed away seven years ago. Yes, she knew that he had been orphan in Mogilev, but no, she didn't have enough knowledge about what her husband had experienced during the war. She didn't, of course, know anything, knew anything about this diary or this letter that her husband wrote. She was grateful for the unexpected information that was available from Tauber's notebook and even sent to us uh, photographs and other information about her husband. This case taught me an important lesson. What may appear to be unimportant to one person, in this case to the owner of the material, may prove to be highly significant to another human being, a relative, the researcher, or the public at large. And there is another point here which I would like to address. We need to connect not only documents, but also people. In order to accomplish this mission, we need the cooperation of many, many people in order to put together the pieces of this huge puzzle. It is basically impossible to accomplish this goal alone. Another example. In a Christian cemetery in a Polish village located not far from Auschwitz, there is a gravestone, this gravestone. It is located on a mass grave designating uh, the burial place of 45 people, victims of a death march from Auschwitz-Birkenau, January 1945. Unlike many other victims of death marches, these victims received bur burial. The local priest, Pavel Lisch, decided for humanitarian reasons to bury the dead people and to record their names by listing, they have no name, so he had to list all the tattooed numbers on their arms on a small note. This is this was done by his assistant. He asked later on the assistant to copy them onto the gravestone 
that was erected. So we have this gravestone, no name, only numbers. If we attempt to decipher the numbers, to discover the names behind the numbers, we will find, for example, inmate number 43405, which had been given to an inmate named David Pastel. This is David Pastel and his son. David Pastel was a Polish-born Jew who immigrated to Paris before, before the war. In June 42, he was sent from the Bon La Roland transit camp in France on transport number five to Auschwitz. As we saw, shortly before the liberation, he was murdered during the last steps of the death march. How has David Pastel's life story been restored? It was not an easy task to do. Information about David Pastel gathered in a lot of places, actually. We have his photograph, we have a page of testimony filled up by his son who survived. We have deportation lists. We have his personal card from the Bona Holland camp. We have also uh, a Passover Eve ceremony in Bona Holland. He is there. Someone even was trying to rescue him, a German uh, person from in Auschwitz. He received later on an award from Yad Vashem as a righteous among the nation. We have his name and photograph as well. The problem is that it's gathered, that it's spread all over the world. Part of it is in Yad Vashem. Part of it we can find in uh, Poland, in the Auschwitz Museum in that case. Part of it in Paris, in France, in Montreal de la Shoah. Part of it not far from here, in the ITS collection, in Bad Aursen. For this reason, Yad Vashem became one of the partners and leaders of this new European project that was mentioned before ERI, European Holocaust Research Infrastructure, with the support from the FP7 program of the European Union. 20 organizations located in 13 different countries are cooperating in this project. U University, of course, is one of them. The project has aimed, among its various goals, to map out the location of this information and to share this knowledge with everybody. By connecting collections, by connecting knowledge and people, in those uh, 20 sub-project work packages during four years, we hope to connect the network of researchers as well as to connect the data about the locations of the collections. We hope that by the completion of this project we will have that we will have established, we will have a huge database regarding all organizations and institutions that have Holocaust collections of documents. I would like to return to my basic argument. I am convinced that humanity's knowledge bases should be open and accessible to everyone. To everyone and also, and mainly today, mainly through the internet. I am convinced that this must be and should be without almost any restrictions or limitations. When I say it, I usually hear from people three arguments against the application of this principle. A lot of people are saying, well, it's important. It is very, very highly important. But first, it is not economical. Who will pay for this effort? The second one is it goes against the right for personal privacy according to various privacy laws. So it's illegal in a lot of cases. We want, but we can't. And the third one is for whom? This information is of interest to only a small number of people, a limited number of people. So why should we make such an effort? These three arguments are, in my opinion, rather exaggerated. And I would like to explain why, again, by my own experience. So I'll start with the first question. Who will pay? Well, indeed, these efforts are perhaps not economical. The study and use of the humanities was never a clear-cut matter of economical gain. However, this matter is less expensive than what you may think. Here is one small example. I assume that you know it, but if not, it's important that you 
that you will. The Bundesarchiv downloaded about 100,000 photographs to the Wikipedia website. These photographs are available to users of the internet for free and without almost any restrictions. But I learned from the vice president of the Bundesarchiv recently that this project actually has become profitable for them financially. How could that be, you might, you might ask? Well, the photographs which caught now the attention of many, many people, much more than ever, were published in Wikipedia for free, but they appear on the internet on a low resolution. If someone wants to use the photographs for publication or for display in the museum exhibition, etc., he needs a higher resolution, but then he is requested to pay for that higher resolution file. This payment covers the salary of the people dealing with the supply of such photographs, and there is money that was left there uh, more than uh, those uh, salaries. So we can observe, therefore, models for actual economic profit, or at least less uh, losing, evolving from the publication of this material on the internet. And there was a second question about the privacy law. This is much more, I think, a problematic question. And it became indeed much pro more problematic in recent years, because we have to obey to the restrictions of the law, of course. But it is still problematic because I feel that in this field, at least in my, of recent, we are surprisingly witness to difficulties regarding access to archival material in Western and Central Europe, not only in Eastern Europe, much more than in previous years. So I, I would imagine that in those years that we are opening everything, it will be easy to get access to those materials. But on the contrary, in Austria, for example, legislation was enacted approximately 10 years ago limiting access to personal documentation. In the Netherlands, in recent years, the period that documentation that includes personal information disclosed to the public was increased from 50 years to 75 years. In the past three years in the Netherlands, we, I have not been able to copy any personal material on child victims. None. I think that it is in a way, a polite, from my point of view, immoral way to hide information. We are preserving the victim's dignity, from my point of view, when we uncover the information on their face. I would like to share with you a very typical example where blocking knowledge might become immoral to my mind, again, at least in that case. Our main problem problem when we are trying to uh, re-establish the names of the victims is, for example, this uh, grave with thousand people, no name. We are working very hard. In recent 50 years, we discovered most of the names of the Jews who were lived and murdered in Western Europe. But as east as we go, as less as we know. And here I'm speaking only about the names, not about the histories. So, for example, in Poland we know less than half of the names, only names, of the Jews who were murdered. In Belarus, we know only a quarter of the names of the murdered Jews, etc. Let's take an example. In that case, documents may assist us. The example is from uh, Brest-Litovsk in Belarus. Before the war, 21,000 Jews had lived there, 40% of the population, 25,000. In 1967, an Israeli person from Tel Aviv filled up this page of testimony. We have few versions of those pages. This is in Hebrew. So in 97, in 67, he filled it up, and he wrote in Hebrew, you have to write what is your relationship with the victim. So he wrote that he was a town mate. He was not a relative, but he knew him from town. And he wrote the name, Dr. Begun Aryeh, and he wrote in Hebrew that he was a physician and that he was murdered in the ghetto in Jeshch. So from this small page, we know that there was such a person, maybe he was his physician, I don't know, I assume, and that's the evidence. In recent years, we are copying documents all over the former Soviet Union and all over Europe, as I mentioned. 
We copy documents from Brest-Litovsk, from the municipal archives in Brest. We found a huge pile, a unique huge pile of 11,000 applications like that, requests for ID after the beginning of the war. All the Jews had to fill it up. And this is a photograph of Aryeh Bigun. And he wrote also that he was a lekaj, which means a physician, and that he used to live in Pilsutsiego Street, number 13, and he even signed. So here we have a bit more, a photograph. We continued to copy in the municipal archives, now in the tax department, which might be, as you may assume, much more interesting. Every uh, month they had to fill up tax declaration after the occupation. This is a tax declaration from October 41. He still lives in Pilsutskego number 13. He's a dermatologist and he earns 810 rubles per month. But the tax supervisor writes below that he examined, he checked it, and Arya Begum is accepting a lot of patients, 42 patients, back at home. Each one of them is paying to him cash, 30 rubles. So his income is much higher. It's not 810, but 6,850 rubles per month. Well, a bourgeoisie life of, uh, of, uh, of a physician who has to leave the day after the occupation, the beginning of a life story. Four months later, December 41, another tax declaration, now in handwriting. Now he lives in, in another address. It's Kosciuszko number 73. Why? Because he was forced to move there. This is the address in the ghetto. And between the lines, you learn that he had done, had made a decision. His decision was to continue to be a physician. Now under the leadership of the local Yudmrat, he opens a clinic, and here he gets only 200 rubles per month, not 6,000, neither 810. How can you live with that? A year later, another tax declaration, two weeks before the liquidation of the ghetto, still tax declaration, and here he earns only 100 rubles. And maybe this is his last signature, because two weeks later, February 15th, 1942, all the Jews of Brest had been taken to a killing pit uh, outside Brest and were murdered there. And how do I know? Because special investigation commissions led by the Soviets um, just during the liberation documented everything. This was documented in 44 already by the Soviets. So we have the coordinates of the exact rural place of all the Jews in Brest, including Arya Bigun. So we have exactly all the apparent rural place of uh, Arya Bigun. And they also have there, but, and by the way, this is not in Brest. This was copied in Moscow in a huge collection in the Garf archive of those Chegeka, uh, how it called, uh, Extraordinary Soviet Commission on Nazi Crimes. They documented also the names of the victims. And here we found the name of Arya Begun, but here for the first time we learned that he was not alone. That with him, they murdered also his wife, Sophia, 48, and his two daughters, Cecilia and Shulamit, 22 and 16. We didn't even know before that he had a family. We needed those black and white copies of those bureaucratic, boring documents in order to know that he had a family. Knowing that, we could easily now link it or to go back to this huge pile of 11,000 applications from 41 and find out that each one of them filled up such a form with a photograph. So by using those collections, we reconstructed the life of a whole family. In order to do so, if exposure is the goal, you have to re-establish your whole cataloging system, we have learned. Because if you want to connect a name to a document, to a file, to a collection, to a record group, you need a system that will enable you to do so. It's not enough to want to do so, you have to reconstruct the whole uh, methodology in order to achieve that goal. We had to do it more than 10 years ago. And we had to uh, use um, a unique cataloging system that knows to do it cleverly. So taking in account the goal goes back to the methodologies that we need in order to, in order to expose it. 
what we uh, may find. And therefore, I can uh, show today a huge database uh, with uh, millions of entries with automatic narrated story. You see, this is the indexed data, but we narrated it automatically. And therefore, because it's based on a, a huge set of keywords, it's another feature of that methodology that we invented. And therefore, by translating those keywords, we can translate it very easily to Russian and to Hebrew on the spot, each one of the pages automatically, with the scanned image. 11 million people used, visitors used our database last year. In my reading room, I have 10,000 people per year. 30,000 people are sending applications. 11 million people are using it. This is the size of the central database of Shoah victims. And today, it's, uh, it contains 6.2 million entries, or named occurrences, which reflects information about approximately 4 million people. And the last one, the third and last argument or question posed to us was, this information is of interest to only a small number of people, so why make such an effort? This argument is more challenging. And first of all, they ask, they ask me first to prove that the material that I'm speaking about is of interest to anyone. Why should we invest in such efforts when we don't even know if anyone will even look at it? They want me to prove it before. I personally believe quite the opposite is true. Opening up such a material to the public is what we actually create, is what actually creates audience. Access creates relevancy. To quote a phrase, if you build it, they will come. This phrase, if you build it, they will come, is attributed to the US President Theodore Teddy Roosevelt regarding the Panama Canal. I really haven't found any evidence that he actually said it. What I do find, find or do found, is that the phrase comes from the classic Hollywood movie, Field of Dreams, starring Kevin Costner. In the movie, Costner's character hears a mysterious voice that says this particular phrase to him. Well, he builds a baseball field out of his cornfield, and ghost players from the past come and are watched by large crowds. Well, for me, if you build it, they will come means something a bit wider, but connected. It means that, or I'm using it in the sense of if something good is built, it will automatically create demand. Access creates relevancy. Here is an example for a visual archive that we have recently put online with cooperation in that case with Google, our photo archive. I'll try to move to, for a live presentation. We'll see if it works. <coughs> Okay, this is Google. I write here, Pilica, the hometown of my grandmother in Poland, and Holocaust. Among the first hits here, you may see that part of the Answers are from collections.yadvashem.org. I'll click on the first one, this one. It brings me directly to a photograph in a context. This is the Yad Vashem arch photo archive, the second version. The first one was a version that we established alone, we did it alone, by our own means, in our own site. Um, but in January 2011, uh, approximately five months ago, we uploaded this current version, um, and now it's made life different. Why? Because before, people had to know three things in advance. First, they had to know that there is a Yad Vashem in the world. Second, they had to know that Yad Vashem has a photo database online. And third, 
that there is a possibility that it con contains a photo of a synagogue. Why to imagine that a synagogue will appear in a Holocaust-related archive? Now the searcher doesn't need to know any of these details because we have added, and this is one of the main uh, 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 things that are here now, what we call deep indexing to this database. You know that archives hate deep indexing, usually. And this is why uh, there is a lot of knowledge in the, in the web, but not necessarily the correct or the necessary one. But we added here the ability or the deep indexing feature meaning that all the details of the database are indexed and can be retrieved via any internet search engine. But what you get is the item in a context. You get this page. The significance of this is dramatic from the aspect of the users. Let me go back to the presentation for a while. Because since we uploaded it five months ago, see, more than 600,000 people used it. If I'm counting it in four months, it's more than all the people who used that database during those more than 50 years of, of opening of the, data, of, of the archive in four months. Each one of them, uh, the average visit duration was uh, more than eight minutes. Each one of them uh, saw approximately 25 uh, pages per, per visit. It's huge. And which means that um, uh, it created the public. One third of the qu uh, queries, in cases where it was possible to identify the query, because we have uh, the tools of Google, were questions regarding places, not about the Holocaust at all. The phrase Holocaust was not there. Why, for example, 23% from Poland? Usually it's 5 to 8%. Why 23 if you ask me, I have no idea. And this is the point. Whenever we assumed anything about the audience, we apparently were wrong. Here is another case when we wanted to um, information about a person. In that case, Israel Volak, not Holocaust. I find only you can find only one document. If this Israel Volok will click, or someone will click Israel Volok, you'll find only one document in the Yad Vashem collection. It's a map, a drawing actually, uh, in two sides, black and white, and the colored one, of his hometown, Milnice, in Poland, in Poland of those days. Um, for him, it is the relevant information in the whole universe. He could find it only because he used a known search engine, not because he knew that he'll find it in Yad Vashem. And down here, you may find also that we enabled another feature, and this is another experiment, exper experiment that we are uh, having now. The public assists us in correcting, adding, and completing information about the Yad Vashem collection of photographs. One leading co contributor you can see here his name is Roman M. Roman M is from Austria. He works for us for free. Um, in the past four months, he added more than 5,000 notes to us. This is the average work pace of one of my employees annually. We don't have to accept every note. Here, for example, he said that we were wrong. It's not Poland, it's Ukraine. According to our rules, it's Poland, it's not Ukraine, but never mind, at least he tried. But in this case, for example, by the way, you have to be, uh, uh, you have to subscribe, you have to be a known subscriber in one of the open uh, accounts that exist, Google account, Yahoo accounts, etc. 600 people like that are, are registered as contributors already, 7,000 uh, contributions were done already. And uh, last example from a well-known photograph from the Lodge Ghetto. 
there is a note here in the bottom, submitted by someone who does not work at Yad Vashem at all. And uh, she recognizes uh, her mother in the photograph, for example. The example that I gave is indeed special. It deals with the traumat a traumatic event, the Holocaust. And I believe that we have a special reason and a moral obligation to reveal this event. I hope, though, that it will not block you from accepting at least part of my claiming. I think that it is still possible and mandatory to learn from this example regarding the study of humanities in general altogether. If we will reveal all the knowledge that we have accumulated, we might lose full control over the vast knowledge. But this knowledge will become in turn relevant to all, which means it will become theirs not less than ours. And making knowledge and information relevant means, after all, the making of an enlightened and moral act, rather than hiding such knowledge and information for fear that it might harm someone. If someone good, something good is built, it will automatically create demand. If you build it, they will come. Thank you.